Welcome to the Scottish Paranormal Podcast, I'm your host Chris and here we'll be delving into the multitude of strange occurrences that happen within Scotland and beyond. You can contact us with your accounts at the Scottish Paranormal Podcast at gmail.com, you can find us on all social media channels and you can contact us by either means. Uh, just to kind of invite you in, I mean, so thanks for coming on the show. Um, so it's Daz, Daz Smith, artist, author, designer, photographer, and what you're on here for, what I'm interested in, um, and my audience will be as well. Um, some of them might not know quite a lot about remote viewing, but I've got a bit of an interest in it. I'm not an expert in that or anything, but I've just got a good interest in it. So that's why I've got you on the show, to, um, to basically give us a bit of knowledge on it, and yeah. maybe a wee bit about yourself as well, and, and what you've experienced and stuff. So um, to kick off, I, I'd, I'd just like to know a wee bit about yourself to start off, if you want to give us a, a brief intro. Yeah, sure. Um well, I've been studying remote viewing now for, uh, I think, 26 years, going on 27. Um, before I found remote viewing, uh, I've been interested in paranormal uh, studies all my life. Uh, even from an early, as early age as, as 10, I remember reading books um, and being, you know, quite enthralled by it and reading the books over and over and over. And that was it, you know, that was it, uh, what we call junior school back then. Mm-hmm. Um, at, at the age of 15, I took what we call formal training. Um and I, I was lucky enough to be able to take training early enough because I grew up in a house where my mother was a spiritualist and she was also a clairvoyant healer. So we had a we had a library of books there and I had access to uh, I had access to teachers, basically. So it allowed me to take early training at the age of 15 in mediumship, clairvoyance, uh, healing and scrying with pretty much everything out there. So that was, mirror, you know, a, a black mirror um even th- you know standard things like crystal balls uh sand readings tea leaf readings tarot cards uh so I, I training all that kind of stuff for a number of years um and it was good and i had a good skill level in all that but it always felt like it was lacking something for me mm. so in 1992 i heard the term remote viewing mentioned at a ufo conference in leeds um and essentially it was a guy claiming to be an, an ex-cia spy who was a psychic uh, using using his mind to travel in time and space? And the moment I heard that, that was that was it for me. It was like, wow, I you know that's that's what I want to do, um, and that's where I've been since. I've been training myself and uh, practicing it, and now running or, or being part of a full time business for the last four going on five years, offering services to people uh, in in remote viewing as well. Hmm. Totally interesting subject. Um... That when you just well, before I kind of jump into some of the questions, if you want to, because maybe some of the listeners don't know where remote viewing is going to stand off. I know this question could be you could actually yeah. have a whole podcast and there's one question, right? But I'm asking a brief overview. So if you can maybe you, you alluded there, obviously, um, about the, the US government can, can, can you start yeah. a bit about remote viewing? And before that, I think obviously, like there was other governments starting other stuff and different programs, but do, could you give a, a brief description of? Can you where it started and then uh, yeah. from there just to kind of give the maybe listeners a wee bit of an overview of remote viewing overall before we kind of delve into your own stories and, and stuff absolutely like that. yeah i mean it's a it's a real complex story really but i'll give you an, a, a summary version of it and mm. the summary is uh from 1972 to 1995 when it stopped the american government uh using subcontractors um like like companies called SRI or Stanford Research Institute, mm-hmm. they investigated using uh, psychics under scientific protocols, which we now call remote viewing, um, to essentially spy on the Russians uh, and to do all kinds of espionage things, you know, look for secret weapons, secret bases, and even find people, drugs, all kinds of things. 
nearly every intelligence agency in the United States used them. The DEA, NSA, FBI, you know, they all used remote viewers for for a part in those years. Uh, And as I said, the program went on from 72 to 95. Um, some people out there, the skeptics claim that it never worked because when the CIA admitted it in, in 1995 and went public, they said, you know, they looked at it, um, found it didn't work and then stopped it. But that's essentially not the truth. That's their cover mm. story because remote viewing itself, every single year of its inception had to go before various committees to get funding to carry on for the, for the next year. Yeah. So they had, you know, and that was, uh, that was in their internal committee within SRI. And then there was scientific oversight committees. There was congressional oversight committees, all sorts of committees that all looked at results, found it worthwhile, and then year on year for twenty three years funded it to go on for for the you know for the following years. That wouldn't have happened if they weren't getting great results from it. Mm-hmm. That's essentially it in summary form. Yeah. Uh, after ninety five, it it kind of went public. The CIA, the people that were, you know, they were working for the CIA and for the military doing this kind of thing. They all came out into the public domain and now they taught people like me and many others out there. And they still do teach them to this very day in the very same techniques um, in, in what we call the public domain or or the private field to now. And many of us are doing it for practice and, and, you know, for fun. And I also do it, as I said, for part business business where I try to find information for my clients that they can't get. In, in any other way really mm-hmm. and and if, if people want to look look up some of the um the different projects that were running it was like a stargate program and the other one was yeah. girl frame girl flame yeah. spit it out real thing <laughs> scan gate uh dragon absorb stargate there were, there were various programs uh, i have a website called remoteview.com and yeah. on that i have a vast amount of resource i have thousands of freedom of information act cia documents i have training manuals videos mm-hmm. i even i even published my own magazine called eight martinis.com i've been doing that f- for 13 years now i think we're on uh, edition 19 i've just published uh, last week and that's for free as well so they can download all those remote viewer magazines for free and in each one of those magazines there are there are historical documents there are articles people wrote theories and there's lots of examples uh real world examples of people using remote viewing and the feedback so you can see how accurate they were mm-hmm. I, i'd recommend any listeners if they want to look into it to to go to dazzy's site i'll put it in the show notes and stuff there's a plethora of information on there i go can he there's just that much to take in you know what i mean so um i'll be going definitely going back into it and dipping into it um mm-hmm. but I'd, I'd recommend to go and look at it and stuff so when when you took the plunge yourself to um get trained in remote viewing did, did you before going into your training and stuff did did you see a difference between remote viewing being more kind of clinical based if you know what they're scientific based rather than being like people would these days maybe call it the woo or like, things like that and it maybe took a wee bit of that um off the subject so it was a bit more kind of um acceptable in that sense yes, yes. And that's why I like it, really. Um, before I found remote viewing, you know, if I was if I was having a common um, psychic occurrence, you know, or trying to give information to a client, say, mm-hmm. um, the usual way of doing it with a clairvoyant or a medium type person is, you know, I would be sat across from them or in the same room, and you know, I would, you know, you'd greet them, and then you then you kind of tune in, and then you try to give them information, but they would be sat across from you. Yeah, and you know, we have to be honest there when you have the that you as the psychic psychic and the client in the room, there are lots of other things that could be taking place other than psychic information. Mm-hmm. You know, we, you could be picking up on pheromones. You could be picking on, um, you know, body language, you know, uh, acute signals in speech, you know, it, it pauses in speech, tones that go up and down. We all pick up on these subtleties. Yeah. So you don't really know how much of the information you as a psychic and, and them as a client are are giving each other with re- with remote viewing um it's essentially any psychic skill really um but wrapped within a certain amount of what we call scientific protocols mm-hmm. um and one of the pro uh, what the protocols are number one it's never spontaneous there's always a pre-planned project mm-hmm. number two the remote viewer is always blind to the target so when so when i do my, my remote viewing I don't know what the target is whatsoever, and no one in my vicinity when I'm doing it also knows what the target is. 
Um, the first thing is uh, we also we always record the information that could be on audio tape, video tape, or on paper or on, on tablets nowadays. We, most of us use. Uh, and one of the crucial things for remote viewing is there should always, for every project, be an element of feedback available. Uh, and so then you can take the remote viewing information, you know your known data in the feedback, and then you can look at the remote viewing information and give it a score of accuracy based on the known knowledge that you know. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the main points that we always have for every remote viewing session. And we call those the protocols, the scientific protocols. Um, and that's that's really the only determining factor from what I do against what what other psychics and mediums and, and clairvoyants claim to do. You know, we just do it a bit more scientifically, yes. Mm -hmm. Which for me is great because uh it means I have a great 26 year track record of, of of sessions that I can assess for accuracy. I know for a fact that every single one that I've done, I'm blind. I know nothing about the target whatsoever when I'm doing it. Yeah, and so I know that the only channel of information that I'm giving is purely psychic information. Did you did you find that um, with your feedback and reviewing of what you looked at, um, where, if, like for example, if you're getting the same kind of feelings or thoughts, and you you ha through different viewings, what to maybe steer away from in other viewings so you'd be more accurate in next ones, if you know what I mean? Does that make yeah, sense? It's a, no. it's a continual learning process because. Um, being psychic and, and, you know, being a remote viewer is very subtle. And, you know, for those people that don't know much about remote viewing, uh, the, the term remote viewing is, is, is a bad name for it, really, because the majority of what we get information-wise, you know, when I'm doing my thing here, and I usually just sit at this desk doing it, mm -hmm. um, it's not visual. It's hardly visual in any way. Mm -hmm. Most of the information I get coming in is, it's just very subtle feelings inside me. So I'll be, you know, I'll be sat there with a sheet of paper in front of me and I'll be, you know, sit, and I use my, all my senses when I'm remote viewing. And that's another great thing about it is, you mm -hmm. know, I use my sense of touch, taste, smell, hearing, and I can move around the target. So I'll be there. Sit, and I don't know what the target is. I'm usually just given an identification number. We call it a coordinate, mm -hmm. but each target is given like a four or eight digit number, a random number. And that's just for admin purposes, really, because you know, if the target was the Eiffel Tower, for example, mm -hmm. I couldn't add the I couldn't add the, the tasker sending me, you know, your your task is the Eiffel Tower, because A, I would know what it is, and I have all these preconceived ideas. Yeah. So they write that down and they hide that behind a number. So they'll just give it a random number, two two eight six or something. Mm -hmm. And all I'll get as a remote viewer is this is project two two eight six. Tell mm -hmm. me what's there. So I'll sit down with the number 2286 and I'll, I'll write that on a sheet of paper. I'll write 2286. And literally, I'll be there asking myself questions. I'll be like, okay, you know, if I was at this target, what would it smell like? And the very first impressions that come in, and it's not, I don't actually get a physical smell sensation. I just know what that smell would be. It's the first word that comes into my subconscious that kind of bubbles up. That's what I would write down. And I do that for all my senses. So I'll sit there and go, okay, what's the temperature at the target? First word that pops in, I'll write it down. And then I'll say to myself, okay, if I was touching it with my physical fingers, what would it feel like? And I'd be like, okay, it feels hard. It feels cold. It feels metallic mm -hmm. and, and so on. So although we call it remote viewing, there's hardly any viewing in it. Occasionally, we do get these real brief flashes in our head uh, of, uh, of, of an image that's hazy. It's gone. It's almost like when you look at a light bulb and then you look away. And you get that afterglow. Mm -hmm. That's that's how the psychic impression is. It's like a, an afterglow type thing. That's it's there for a second, but it's not really there. It's a bit hazy. Mm -hmm. We do get those, but that's not the major part of of what remote viewing is. It's mainly just really subtle words and impressions that come from from your whole body, really, from deep inside of you. Mm -hmm. When when you went to learn remote viewing, so yeah. where did you go? Where, where did you? find i mean I, I can imagine probably back in if it was back in the 90s it probably it was probably quite a hard it was thing to find then you know what i mean because yes. i know obviously come back then it was not like as well known as it is now yeah um so really it was very to... hard back then um it's much easier now because people like myself have put all our stuff online but in the 90s because i learned it in 96 mm -hmm. and uh that was just after the american government went public and there were some people, you know, some of the people that worked for the CIA and the military were doing training, mm -hmm. but, it, you know, it was only based in the US usually, and it was very expensive, costing thousands at a time. Yeah. Um, I managed, though, to get on a, a private 
discussion board with other remote viewers talking about remote viewing at the time. Mm -hmm. And I managed to uh, make communications with a guy that was in Russia at the time, claiming he was training uh, people there in special forces type medicine. He said he'd also been training in in our in uh, remote viewing uh, and that he was popping through London on the way home. And he invited me to take a, a two week course with him up in London. So, yeah, that that's what I did. Um, and I, yeah, I've been kind of learning and practicing that method and also evolving that method to work better with me um, over these 20, yeah, 20, 26 years since. The only thing I can ever remember seeing in about remote viewing back in the day was at the probably at the, the back of the, the UFO magazine or something like that, things like that back in the day. That's when yeah. you, you maybe seen like a wee coast there, maybe an obscure one somewhere. Uh, but yes. that was all the only time I've ever seen it. I mean, but I knew it obviously when it, when it came out and stuff like that. Yeah. One thing that did interest me though um, was so with what you were explaining there, can you explain a difference between because I've, I've heard when people talking about um, remote viewing and they, they talk about biolocating, right? Mm -hmm. And there's also you've also got, um, for example, astral travel. Is yeah. could could you describe a bit of difference between um, astral travel compared to remote viewing to compare yeah. to even biolocating if that's maybe the same as astral travel or, or whatever so just to kind of clear it up a wee bit yeah absolutely there, there are definitely clear differences astral traveling is where you're you're usually half asleep you're let down and you're in a, a a state you know you put yourself in what we call a flow state where you can then kind of try to move your consciousness or your body out or your your etheric body out of your physical body mm -hmm. um, and maybe go to other locations. Remote viewing is completely different in that, in that when I do my remote viewing, or most of us do it, we're literally just sat at a desk with a stack of paper or, and a pen or a tablet. So there's no, mm -hmm. I mean, there is a slight altered state of consciousness in that you're, you're, it's a bit like when you're doing a martial art or, or something that takes a great skill level, mm -hmm. get into what we call the flow state or the zone. So you're, you're really in in fraud in what you're doing ra and rather than in the real world mm -hmm. but it's not like it's not like uh, astral traveling when you are in deep states of meditation mm -hmm. um yeah so that's the main difference really but the by location thing uh and i will and I, I have to say now before we go anywhere else with this i've seen no evidence whatsoever that a remote viewer actually tr or travels in any in any way to any of the sites that we look at in time and space mm -hmm. um we don't know how it works yet we, we you know it needs a huge big project with multi millions and multi years to be able to try to work out the mechanism behind rv because we we are still stumped by this i kind of think that it might follow what we're learning about quantum physics and entanglement and stuff i think it might go along the lines of that yeah um yeah. and you know i think i personally think that, like there's there's a sea of energy in the universe and we're all made up of this energy, everything in the, everything in the universe is made up in this energy and we can just tap into it. Everyone can tap into this energy, but because I've trained myself over 26 years to really understand these really subtle signatures, mm -hmm. that's that, that just makes me a little bit better than a normal person. Um, but the by location thing, I believe that what happens is, as a remote viewer, you're sat there for an hour usually uh, getting data. And as you're getting data, it builds and builds and builds. And as it builds, you kind of open what we call an aperture to the target with. With each stage of your remote viewing, it gets a little bit wider. So you see a bigger picture of the target. Yeah. I think at a certain point where you've had so much data come into you uh, that you're recording down on paper, um, it's my belief that you kind of, or your mind kind of, builds or or simulates what that you know what that target would be if you were there in real time because of the data that's coming in you know if you're getting data like it's hard it's round there are things moving there are people it looks like they're walking they're on the streets all this information is building up a scenario in your mind and i feel that the build by location is that you get to a point when there's so much data coming in, you've almost tricked your mind, almost like virtual reality, into mm -hmm. simulating that you are actually there at the target site. Mm -hmm. I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just I've, I've always kind of found it interesting regards in the two because it was when I I'd maybe watched documentaries about it in the past, I read books in it in the past, and yeah. and people describing it being there or uh, descriptions of what they were um, referring to. 
And it was trying to differentiate between was it in regards to the same as in Astro Travel where like we knew Astro Travel, it seems like they're physically there. Yeah. Well, physically, well, not physically, but consciously there and they can yes. see yes. after a certain time they can see what's around about them and stuff like that and, yeah. and, and things like that. So it was trying to kind of differentiate between the two. And um, I know obviously we like um, back in the day, I mean, so Robert Monroe was in the yeah. Monroe Institute was developing all the um, yes. out of body stuff. And he, yeah. he was involved in remote viewing as well and stuff as well. Where, yeah, um, yeah. Remote viewing uh, is kind of similar, but completely different in the same, it, it, you know, because when you're doing the astral travel, you are like in a very deep altered state of consciousness. You know, you're halfway sleep, halfway not. Um, whereas remote viewing, uh, you know, I'm usually, I can, and I have done this in the past, I can be sat here with, with my, pen and pad you know writing writing stuff drinking a coffee listening to music and having a conversation with someone at the same time as i'm doing my information mm. there is a slight altered state of consciousness as i said into the flow state but it's nowhere it's nowhere near as deep as is some of those classical techniques like a uh, astral projection yeah mm-hmm. no it's, i've been kind of looking at um for the last few while i've been looking through robert monroe's stuff as well yeah. and uh, extremely interesting you know i mean i, I found that interesting as well where so where he was involved in some, I think, trying to develop some of the stuff for the US military as well, for Hemisync, did, yes. a remote viewing as well. Yep. And uh, have you ever tried in that? Does, that? does that make it any more successful or like trying Hemisync with it and stuff? <laughs> it doesn't work for me, but saying that I do, uh, whenever I do remote viewing, I, I do always listen to classical music. Um, mm. Everyone's got their own different things. I, uh, I yeah, I've, I don't think I've ever done a remote viewing session without listening to music. Mm. Uh, and I, I do pick classical music because I, I don't want music where people have or they're talking words in it because I feel that those words might affect my subtle flow of data, you know, might influence it. So that's why it's classical music for me. And I have in the past yeah, used meditation music and, and hemi-sync music as well. And some of the remote viewers out there, I would say, uh, uh, you know, some like 30, 40 percent of them do use hemi-sync type music to, mm. to what we what we call call them down or get you into get you into a, a state where you want to start your remote viewing no it's, it's, it's totally interesting i mean it's a thing i've been interested in a while and it's it's where you you look at that aspect that even with like like say if you look at astral travel and stuff and um how like when no developed it and yeah. like, a, a way to do it and then when you look at maybe some of the more esoteric stuff it, it's, it's all the same yes apart from it, it's just a more kind of rigid Kind of way yep. getting there, um, um, I so it's just I've, I've always kind of found it kind of extremely interesting. Yeah, um, can you explain any? I know there, there's um, we listen to some of your podcasts, mm-hmm. I know you there's descriptions of different types of remote viewing. Can you give a brief description of different types as well? Yeah, there are three main types at the moment. Um, there's ERV, which is uh, short for extended remote viewing, uh. And that is a bit, a little bit like what you know, what you're talking about with your astral projection. So the remote viewer then is usually led down or in a or semi led down, and they do go into a very deep state where they're almost asleep, but they have a monitor in the room, so the monitor is asking them questions, and the them as the remote viewer trying to answer. But you know, it's very hard. You know, they can't pick up a pen, of course. You know, so they're having to the audibly say things, which is then recorded in in that way or once they finished it they come out of their rv session and then they try to write it after the fact so that that's erv mm-hmm. then there's the normal remote viewing which is kind of like what i do mostly which is you know you just sat there and you, you've got paper and pen or a pad or even doing it on the whiteboard i do a lot of my stuff live on a whiteboard with a video camera watching me mm-hmm. so that's normal remote viewing and we have another subset which you know tens of thousands of people are playing with which is called associative remote viewing and we generally use that for um, trying to determine outcomes of things like like football games, uh, stocks and shares in the markets. Mm. Essentially, what you do with that is you have you, you pick like a, uh, an event like a football game. Like you know, we just had the England game a couple of days ago, which they lost, um, and we know there would be an outcome for that. So you try to do it beforehand, and you kind of say, okay, you know, you have the two teams, and which one which one will be the winner at the end? You so you have team A and team B. So for associated remote viewing, you associate, say, something with Team A, and it may be, I don't know, a mouse, for example. Mm-hmm. And then you associate with Team B, um, Big Ben, you know, the, the the clock in London. And then you say to the remote viewer, I'm going to give you one of these 
as what's going to happen in the future, you know, who's going to win. Mm -hmm. um, so I want you to go to the future and remote view which target I'm going to give you. So the remote viewer does his RV session and you have to then determine from his data whether he's describing a mouse or Big Ben. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's associated with remote viewing. And a lot of people are, as I said, tens of thousands of people are, are playing with different versions of that to try to win things like football games, horse racing, you know, uh, the lottery, mm -hmm. all kinds, all kinds of things. And and the, going back to ERV, when the monitor's asking questions, is he still blind? Uh, that? Is that double, double blind in it, or is, is he asking questions about the target, or is it a case? It, of just it's it's mixed. Up, it's mixed scenarios, and that sometimes they're blind and sometimes they're not. Um, yes. And that's that happened within the military though, because the military did do a certain amount of ERV sessions within their project stuff, more so in the earlier days of of remote viewing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and sometimes the sometimes the monitor knows, and sometimes they don't. So you have to be very careful and have a very well trained monitor that they don't lead the remote viewer too much with what they're, you know, with what they're asking. You know, they they couldn't they again if the target were the Eiffel Tower, you wouldn't want the the monitor to go. To the remote view, something along the lines of, "Okay, I want I, I want you now to move to the structure in France mm -hmm. and tell me what you see." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's that's you doing. But you could say to them, you know, I now want you to move to, I maybe give them a coordinate. Yeah, you know, or I maybe I, I would probably keep it more obscure. Now I would probably say, "Okay, you know, start your RV. I want you now to move to the location." Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's not that's not telling them anything really. Yeah. And then I'd say to them, okay, now you're at the location. Now tell me what you see or describe what you see as a remote viewer. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful. You couldn't you couldn't say now I want you to you couldn't say for example I want you now tell me about the structure you see there because that's that's too you know you're leading too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so it's very it's a subtle art that takes a long time to um, to practice in. But I don't I've I haven't really myself played i haven't really played on the uh erv side of things i've just done the uh spent yeah. the 26 years doing the normal remote viewing read because i was trying to ascertain we've like, been reading some books um and i think it was one one of uh, joe mcgonagall's books and it was um i was kind of i got the incline that when in the military ones of a they were initially doing it i kind of thought they're initially doing it because the well who was in charge at the time was quite skeptical uh so he wanted to see if it was if it was viable, but you could see obviously it was to do with kind of leading questions and all that kind of stuff as well, and yeah, uh, yeah. and that. So it was like double blinded and stuff, but it's, it's totally interesting. Um, so in in your um your own work that you do, I mean, what kind of I mean, I know maybe you, maybe you can't talk about all the work you do, whatever else, mm -hmm. but or in regards to it, but um, when you can, what what kind of general kind of things are you looking for? Um, in yeah, your, what kind of I mean, news? I do all sorts of work at the moment. Um. For example, I, you know, in my past, I worked for a group called Find Me Group, and we worked with, that was a group of psychics and remote viewers from across the world that worked with the central manager who was called Kelly, and he was an ex-DEA agent, mm -hmm. and he was like a go-between between, between a group of psychics and the police forces and intelligence agencies, mm -hmm. so that when they had, uh, and it was all missing people work, so it was when they got to a stage where they just couldn't go any further, you know, they had a case and it was going code. They get, then went to Kelly because they knew him being law enforcement and they could trust him. Mm -hmm. uh, and they would task him, and, which would then come to us as, as third parties to, you know, to try to find the uh, the location of, of missing people. And I did a couple hundred, of, over a couple hundred of those for, you know, pretty much every police force in America at one point. I mm -hmm. did that for about four or five years. And then it, you know, I have to be honest, after doing that week in, week out for, for a number of years, um, the majority of the people that you're looking at are, you know, killed, maimed, you know, mm -hmm. abused, all that kind of stuff. So it got a bit too much after five years. So I stopped it after, after a number of years. But you know, we did at some point help find, uh, you know, help find a, a number of people. Uh, unfortunately, most of them, if not all of them, were were deceased at the time. But we did, mm -hmm. you know, even that was a little bit of help for the families. We did help some families, um, yeah, you know, get to a stage of trying to to move on with it all. So th uh, that's just one avenue of work. Um, I get tasked a lot, again, blindly with uh, looking at mysteries targets. Uh, for example, I just finished one with a group that I work with. Um, and I was actually the project manager on that one. So I set the target and I set it to a group of psychics that I, or remote viewers that uh, I've curated because I know they're really good. Yeah. And we're called, we're called the Hellfire Club. Mm -hmm. Um 
and we do uh, we do a project a month or two, uh, and we do it really in depth, and then we publish all the results online. And the one we just published last week was about a phenomenon in the in the US or talked about in the US a lot called the Havana syndrome. I don't know if you've come across that at all. Yeah. <laughs> Where you know CIA agents and diplomats at, age, uh, at certain embassies and buildings around the world mm-hmm. have been coming down with these very strange almost like PTSD kind of symptoms, mm-hmm. strange noises in their head, mm-hmm. feeling confused and sick, all that kind of very strange kind of stuff. Now the Americans uh, last year determined that they thought it was the Russians using some kind of strange microwave rep- weaponry on them. Mm-hmm. Um, and because we didn't have a definitive answer for that, I set that as a target for the remote viewers to look at. Uh, and I have to be honest, they came back with information. It kind of confirms exactly those thoughts that it's some kind of agency out there using some kind of very strange beam weapon technology that's that's harming people. Mm-hmm. So for yeah, so for example, if anyone you know, I'm sure you'll put the links up for this, but we have a website called hellfirerv.com, uh, and I just put the the video of of all the remote viewing the remote viewers did um, out, out there on that project last week. And we've done other ones as well, looking at UFOs and all kinds of stuff, uh, and and they're they're good ones, but you know, they're a bit different direction because they're mysteries targets. Yeah. And then for my business, uh, I work for or I work as part of a company that we set up four years ago, now going on for five years ago, called Crypto Viewing. And for that, we have a subscriber base that pay us, you know, they pay a small subscription fee each month. And we do all this work for them where we look at cryptocurrencies, we look at gold markets and other markets. Mm-hmm. We also look at, you know, as, as a, a set of four remote viewers, we all also look a month ahead to see what the next month's new top news is going to be. And we and we we give them all that as predictions as well. Mm-hmm. And we chuck in the occasional mystery project and whatever else they want within that as well. So that's a more like subscriber-based infotainment. It's information wrapped in nice yeah. videos and all that kind of stuff. And that's that's been going well. We're on, yeah, as I said, we're nearly on our fifth year of that now. And that has allowed uh, myself and the other remote viewers to build a big team. We're in a team of like 12 with support staff now on the on that mm-hmm. uh, of, of people being paid full and part time to to investigate on where to take this kind of scale in, in new directions really it's very exploratory mm-hmm. um but yeah it's trying to it's trying to use what we've got this intuition in real world situations are they are they based all across the uk or is it worldwide or uh, it's worldwide uh for, for example there are four remote viewers myself edward dick and naeem uh, I'm here in the UK. Uh, Dick's in Hawaii. Edward is in um, Texas, mm-hmm. and Naeem's in Canada at the moment. Yes, interesting. Right, yeah, so we're all over the place. Um, and you know, we meet up once a week, usually on a Tuesday night. Mm-hmm. And luckily for me, though, because everyone else is based in that part of the world, I'm the odd one out. So I have to work on their time. So we usually record our stuff on on Zoom, like we're doing here now. Yeah. It, at 1 30 and what we start at 1 30 in the morning so i'm usually up on that night until <laughs> until four or five in the morning i'm gonna say i mean that's like try to get people from like east coast american stuff and they're always like yeah. either what is it five hours behind them or, or, yeah, or that, yeah. five hours behind that's it yeah usually five but or four hours i have to be honest it's a bit tough trying to be trying <laughs> to be psychic at two o'clock in the morning where all your eyes want to do is just you know close. Yeah, probably, yeah. Um, but it works well and we got a great team of uh subscribers and behind all that as well, we have a we have a members only website where we have all these forums on where they can ask us questions, mm-hmm. and we have all these you know, like group chats. Like I think we got one coming up in late in December where the members can meet us in a Zoom meeting and just ask us live questions, all the, all that kind of stuff. So it's it's a it is it is a great out of the box mechanism that's working well for for remote viewing services mm-hmm. at the moment. What's what's the most interesting target that you've looked at and it could be as out there as you want or what's um oh so many um oh the most uh, i've got so many to be honest um i'll, I'll, I'll give you I'll, I'll give you a couple of ideas if maybe you've if you've ever okay. looked at them before right yeah have you ever looked at uh, oak island i have yes <laughs> that was interesting um and that's uh my my rv session for that is is, is actually for for download on my on my personal website remote view mm-hmm. yeah that was interesting yeah yeah i and i did describe you know i drew accurately the uh the uh the system of of logs and stuff and going down underground and mm-hmm. and riches and chest chest actually chest of valuables i had yeah. that were hidden away there and i had all these men that were carrying the chest but they you know they were 
it, I knew it was all in the past, and they they all had edge cutting weapons, so that would be like swords and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, I'm going to cut. I think I cut you off there. So if you were uh, any any other Kenny kind of odd ones that you've you've looked at yourself, it would be interesting. Yeah, to I mean, there's so many. Like, uh, and again, they're all available online to watch. Like, uh, yeah. I looked at Area 51 and what's underneath the uh, the facility there. Mm-hmm. Uh, if the Roswell crash happened and what happened with that, that was fantastic as well. Mm-hmm. Um. Uh, looked at Jesus once. Jesus was pr- pretty amazing. I think the target was Jesus dying on the cross. Mm-hmm. Of course, I didn't know that when I did it, but yeah. that that was amazing because I'm not really a religious person, but I never felt such feelings of peacefulness and love coming from a life form that I've ever remote viewed in 26 years than than I did on that on that one, mm-hmm. which was yeah, that was very shocking. Um, and I would say probably the best one, and again, this is available on YouTube for the, for the viewers to watch. You can actually see me doing the live RV on camera. Is I was set as, uh, as part of a team. I was set target to look at the uh, the Kennedy assassination, mm-hmm. um, and I was doing that. And I was just you know I was just and again you can look at the the full RV on camera. I was describing these uh, and drawing on, on on whiteboard these these uh, life forms in a vehicle. Mm-hmm. And I could see the trajectories of. of something that was in in motion that was interacting with with the life form and i knew that it felt like someone was being killed or assassinated and i think i wrote that on, on the board mm-hmm. uh, and then i kind of went a bit off piste with the target and i actually decided to follow the person that was being um killed essentially mm-hmm. through through the process to see what happened mm-hmm. um and then i go on for like a 20 minute journey following this life form as they seem to go through these different realms of of interaction and you know how, how their fear and stuff instantly turns off and they have this state of total peacefulness and then they go through these states of energy where these energy forms move towards them and greet them from some other kind of, and i have to be honest I, I my my thoughts on an afterlife and stuff are still to this day a bit i don't know what my belief system is on all that, but that was that was a really interesting uh, one to go through. I have to be honest. And again, as I said, I went through all that live on camera, and that's that's up on YouTube for for anyone to watch. No, it's interesting. I'm really kind of look that out. You know what I mean? As as I was saying, just to the the viewers, that I mean, so remote viewing, you can go um, back in time. Yeah, or um, yeah, back in time anywhere, and even we can go. Yeah, we can go anywhere in time and space. Uh, and we are more accurate on looking at things that have happened and things that are happening now. We're slightly less accurate. I'm at roughly 65% accurate on looking at things that are going to happen in the future. Yeah. Um, whereas my you know, my normal RV, that looking at past and, and, and the present, I would say I'm, you know, over 80% accurate, over 80% of the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I know for a fact that when I'm looking at future bait stuff, because it hasn't happened yet, and there's there's too many probabilities that haven't coalesced into one. Yeah, I'm I'm at roughly sixty five ish percent accurate on on future based targets. So if I'm looking at one target view, every six to seven impressions I give you out of ten will be correct. Mm-hmm. Or if you look at another way, if I look at ten different targets for you, six to seven of them will be correct out of ten, and, and three three to three and a half will be wrong. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. I mean, it's but it's a. Uh, I mean. It's just it's a subject that's always interested me. Like combined the, um, I think it started back in the day looking at astral travel stuff. Yeah. Uh, no saying that I've done it. I've been successful in any sense. Um, but uh, it's just it's been interesting. And then remote viewing, obviously, um, in the mid nineties, getting gone up. I mean, it, a lot came out for that as well. And uh, it's always kind of been in the back burner. But there's a few good, obviously, film online as well. I think what's the third eye spice that's on. Yes. What's that? Yeah, yeah. So it's a good overview of. Uh, what can it happen to SRI? Yeah, that, like that's a great that's a great uh, documentary. It was on Channel Four, I think, around about ninety, uh, ninety four, ninety five. I think that was that, that was out. Yeah, but that that is a great great yeah. overview. It's free. It's free on YouTube though. You can get it on YouTube. It is. Yes. I know. It's just great. Good. I mean, but all right. So, so on remote viewing, has there ever been anything on it which has been um, created any like any negative towards yourself in a sense where? I mean, from a person, but is it is it anything that you've you've looked at? It's been it's it's caused you maybe to think that can you stop doing it or anything like that? Yeah, nothing for me personally because um, 
again, I'm of the belief system, and I can't prove this because we don't know how any of this works. I'm my belief system is that you know I'm just accessing information. I'm not actually going anywhere. So you know, if if the target, for example, is a serial killer, and I'm yeah. you know I'm looking at a serial killer, describing what he's doing, describing what he's feeling when he's doing it. I don't feel personally that that's going to affect me in in any way at all because I'm just I'm just like a, a viewer or a reporter kind of viewing it. Hmm. I have to be honest though, that's not the same for everyone. I think with what we're doing with all this psychic and consciousness research is that we all as individuals bring our own belief systems into it and uh yeah. there are people out there that believe that it does affect them and I think because they believe that it does affect them, it makes it real and it does affect them. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm of a no nonsense system of, of remote viewing in that it doesn't affect me. I'm disconnected from it. I'm just there reporting it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, you know, in all the thousands of bad things that I've looked at, and, you know, I've, you know, I've, I've looked at some pretty bad things over the years. Um, yeah, it doesn't seem to. It doesn't seem to affect me. I, mm-hmm. I just don't allow that in my in my belief system. But yeah. you know, as I said, I think it's malleable. I think it. You have to be very careful. Whatever your belief system is, you bring that into into reality. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. I think I think anyway. There's a, there's a, there's enough stuff on social media and the internet for uh, <laughs> to play your mind anyway, regardless of kind of they go yes, there. Yes. Um, but you know, remote viewing can be used for great tools as well. Stuff that's not being explored enough, and we have to be careful because you know you have uh, you have like laws and stuff like that. Is re- and I have done a few experiments of medical remote viewing. Mm-hmm. Uh, where a doctor friend of mine gave me a blind target. Well, I obviously knew it was a person. And he was like, you know, can you diagnose this person, for example, and tell me what you see with remote viewing? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, I had to set, I had to create a whole new way of doing things where I created these little pictures of the human body, which I would then probe and then write my impressions. So I would like say, okay, I feel like the central nervous system feels like this. The head feels like this. You know, the body here feels like this. The emotional system feels like this. Mm. And I was writing my impressions. Uh, and on one of them, you know, I was writing, like, I could feel this gray, squidgy kind of substance in, in the person's brain. And the only feedback I had, because we had to be very careful on what he could tell me, was that it was a patient with with brain cancer. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we I was getting really good data on that. Mm-hmm. And there are other people out there exploring using remote viewing for medical purposes. You know, again, in the last last resort when a doctor or someone doesn't have anywhere to go it's a really cost effective way of trying trying to get more information that that may give them a lead Mm -hmm. i don't think it's been explored enough and it would be nice if that was explored it it, you know properly in proper medical circles but i don't think it has been what's your thoughts on um so obviously now you'd be you probably maybe say you follow the ufo subjects you know what happened in 2017 and all that kind of stuff and um, where after the, the US government, well, yes, yeah. so they came out. I'd say they came out again, right? So, so, um, so, um, in regards to all that going on, I mean, but you, you see the kind of narrative getting pushed in, or behind the scenes getting pushed into the kind of consciousness aspect to it as well, yeah. Um, and, and things that so constant in an aspect where actually getting pushed out with people like Lou Zondo and Gary Nolan and, and people like that. And I find it interesting where you look at where the experiencers and talking about consciousness. And then they they will be um people like Gary Nolan, for example, like um pulling out information for the ether or for the mm-hmm. like for beyond the veil or whatever else yeah. and, and inventing things or all that kind of stuff. Do you see total parallels between like that and remote viewing and yeah and yeah and, 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 into that field? Yeah, and I've worked for a lot of those those people doing RV work. Mm-hmm. Um, some I can talk about, some I can't. Mm-hmm. Um, and just on my own, like you know, when I've looked, when I looked at the um, the Roswell crash, for example, and you know, I was looking at the craft, and I could see that it was a craft coming down, you know, and it crashing, all this kind of stuff. And it's great because as a remote viewer, you're in charge of what you're doing within your remote viewing session, even though you don't know what you're looking at. Mm-hmm. But, you know, sometimes I kind of know that if I see something or feel that like something's coming down, you know, I, mean, I can feel the motion of it. I can feel it hitting the floor and stuff. So, mm-hmm. I, so I kind of, you know, I kind of know in my head at that point, you know, maybe half an hour into what I'm doing, I kind of know that I'm looking at some kind of man-made vehicle of some kind and it's it's on a trajectory that's crashing. Um, 
But the good thing is, being a remote viewer, I can then say to myself, and you know, we write all this down on the paper so you can see and read it afterwards yeah. and, and determine what I'm doing. I, you know, I key myself with words on the sheet of paper. Okay, now move to the origin of the creation of this structure and, and describe how it's made. Mm-hmm. And then the moment I do that and key myself, I can actually move to a point in time and space mm-hmm. and describe, you know, the skin of the craft, the layers of it, how they're combined, how they're made, what they do. Mm-hmm. Um, and in doing all that within some of these processes on multiple what we call UAP cases now, and I did I did actually uh, a project with my friends where we looked at the Tic Tac UFOs as well. It, on that's on Hellfire as well, so people mm-hmm. can have a look at that. So if we're doing these over and over, um, it, it's my understanding now that uh, consciousness is a major part of the UAP. Uh, situation or UFO situation Mm -hmm. and just from looking at the craft themselves and how they move and how they interact is really strange because the crafts uh, crafts uh, I I didn't even know I could call them crafts in some regards because some of the ones I looked at sometimes when you look at it they're like they're physical oh they're they're moving they're Mm -hmm. non-physical oh they're physical again over here they're non-physical and that's all within the space of like microseconds so yes. the craft itself is like physical and non-physical at the same time mm-hmm. and when you're looking at the craft and how they're driven and how they interact and stuff you can actually see and feel that some of the, i'm not saying all this all on craft all the craft but so, some of the some of the objects or craft are actually um they're conscious as well they're like they're mm-hmm. like artificial intelligences they 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 almost feel well no it's not almost they do feel alive so mm-hmm. they have a sentience about them and it's really interesting. Uh, it's almost like the uh, the person that's driving the craft isn't driving the craft. They're symbiotically interacting with the craft, so they're both driving each each other. It's yeah. very it's very strange. It's almost like, and I think this is how it works. When a person connects with the craft to 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 control and control, it's not the right word because it's not controlling it. As I said, they're working symbiotically. But mm-hmm. when a person connects to the craft. It's almost like some uh, part of the DNA of the person becomes part of the DNA of the craft, mm-hmm. and they're then they're then they're kind of locked and connected, mm-hmm. and it's there's this seamless working together kind of yeah symbiotic relationship. It's very hard for me to describe because it's stuff that I kind of felt, but it's it's amazing to to, to kind of feel that, and it's all yeah, as I said, it's all consciousness based. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think a lot of the stuff that's going on there with with these uh, non humans, because I don't like to call them aliens, because we we have no idea, if, yeah, yeah, it, where they're from. You know, uh, most of it honestly feels like it's interdimensional, yeah. Um, and we're probably more alien to it than them because they've been around for hundreds of thousands of years. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's all co- it's all consciousness space. I think we're only just now starting to, over the last year. I'm seeing it in all the UFO podcasts, yeah, where people are starting to understand how much of a role consciousness really play plays it in this whole scenario definitely yeah that that's there's, there's more and more um for what you said as well more and more reports from experiencers um like uh, merging with the craft and all that kind of stuff yes and, and discussing yeah. that and and um there's, there's stories like that for like like decades yeah. but i think there's there's more and more people talking about it now um because yeah. they, they feel they can talk about it more yeah um, yeah and they well. seem to be these non-humans, or uh, I don't want to class them all like because I think there's a lot going on there. Yeah. But some of them seem to be very interested in our brand of consciousness. We, there seems to be, in some regards to us, some of some of them seem to be very interested in, in how how consciousness works for us, and it's something that they don't have. I'm not saying that's all the same for all of what's going on there, because I think there's lots of multitude of non-humans and all kinds of stuff. But there's at least one set of them that are looking at us and going, "Wow, how can they do that that we can't do?" And I actually think that they know we can do something um, that they can't do, but we don't know that we can do it. Yeah, if you understand yeah. that. So I, I, I think I, there's I, something I, hidden or locked in in human consciousness that we haven't found yet that mm-hmm. we that 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 they 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 want, and yeah, that's why they're that's why they're 
exploring us studying us uh but that's uh, i i i have to stress that's only one subset of what's going on out there totally. that, that's interested in that I, th- I think i found it interesting recently there was a, a guy going back to gary nolan there was a gary nolan interview there's actually a, a few which i've just kind of I've kind of pulled things out of it. um and one of them one of them it said um hypothetically speaking, right? Because most of the time it's always hypothetically speaking. But yes. you know some of these guys are in the know for what they're, what they're doing and stuff. But he said, um he said, well take it for instance, what if what if you could have found out that maybe we were farmed for for something or another. You know what I mean? And we we basically were at the top of the food chain. And and Lou Ozondo said that a number of times and they've been at the top of the food yeah. chain. And then there was another one he said recently, this is back to Gary Nolan again. Which is saying, well, let's say, for example, there's a, a number of different of these either interdimensionals or um or ultra terrestrials or, or ETs or whatever. He said, let's say there's a number of them and there's um there's there's ones who want to get something off us that we've got that mm-hmm. maybe we don't know we've got, and there's other ones that maybe want to protect what we've got. Yes. And then there's other ones overseeing that as well. And but they see us as a, it goes weird just like a sideshow, but this yeah. is all going on as well. Yeah. And uh, I found that interesting. And then when you relay that back to like some of Robert Monroe's work as well, when he's talking about when um the the term Lush, when yeah. he was talking about um one of the routes he got when he was doing all his work when he was yeah. out of yeah. body and going into like other kind of like basically the other place or the other realms yeah. and that. Yeah. Um, he, he was discussing about um about us being farmed, or yes. like for lush, and he said, but it was not that. He, he, I think at the end, he, he, you can he could take it when when you heard what he was describing it was quite um horrifying or whatever else. But he said it, he referred to it. He says, well, you've got it in a sense where we might know we we might not know we've not got it, and it might just be something we don't need or yes, yeah. or whatever it is. And I think the only kind of the wish thing ended up was I don't know, it was hard to even kind of fathom what it came up at the end of it in regards to like it was like love or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was things like that. But um I, I just found I found all that interesting. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because yeah. when you actually look at Robert Monroe's stuff, for example, like all his books and you read all his stuff and everything that happened in Monroe Institute. And you overlay it with what's getting relayed to now in regards to like some of these statements that come out for these people, you're just like, what do you know? You know what I mean? And when you yeah, go back, yeah. another thing as well, when you, you go back and you look at um have you did you have a, have you looked through the overview of the notes of the um it's like the Admiral Wilson notes and stuff like that, where, yes, and going yeah. back to um the advanced theoretical uh, physics group. Mm-hmm. That yeah, yeah. now that's interesting what they're talking about in mid eighties. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, a lot of that kind of stuff. It's like, I mean, what they're talking about then, and they're yeah. still actually just, well, some of them are still just talking about lights in the sky or what is it? I mean, it's like, come on. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But on the gardening thing uh, or the farming thing, and I've got this in several remote viewing sessions and even some of the work we did recently, um, that's, that's the kind of uh, information I was gleaning from looking at some of these beings that were involved is that. They or the ones that I was looking at at the time, anyway, seemed to think of themselves as being gardeners and us as humans being part of their garden that they were they were tending and growing and nurturing mm-hmm. for for their uh, you know for their own uses. But they did have a they did have a kind of not a love a respect I would say for for us as as beings. You know, I don't think it was farming in in like the way we farm you know like like cattle and stuff yeah but they they looked at yeah they the, the words they mentioned were they were gardeners um mm-hmm. and that is you know i don't know if you've seen it but again through hellfire rv um we did a project uh probably about two three months ago now where someone tasked us to look at the what's known as the uh, hitchhiker effect mm-hmm. and the origin of the hitchhiker effect you know the, the paranormal effect that follows people home after they've had a, a uap encounter Mm-hmm. So we 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 looked at that, and in my RV sessions, in the other guys' RV sessions, you actually see us track back to to what happened with the effect. And yeah, a lot of it we track back are to uh, non non human entities in some kind of long term uh, study project with 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 us as uh, with us as human beings. Mm-hmm. Could and you... Again, that's all the RV from that is again available online for people to have a look at as well. Mm-hmm. Did... Did you could you ever experience a, a hitchhiker effect from doing a remote view? 
Um, we haven't had one yet. We, you know, we've not had any negative effects from mm. from looking at, at any of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't say it's not possible. I guess it depends if we had a remote viewer that felt that it could happen to them mm-hmm. that they might uh, have hitchhiked. I understand. Effect. I understand that. With I, because it's, yeah. I, it's it's interesting though. I, I find like the whole kind of um, the mixed baggy paranormal um, kind of just. And especially overlaying with consciousness. You know what I mean? And yeah, it's yeah. the thing is as well, when you look at consciousness now and what's happening, and then and then you, you even tie that into the esoteric stuff, it's just all the same. You know what I mean? It's it like is. and, it's and magic, when you go back to magic, that was just yeah, like yeah. tapping it's into all it. The same. Yeah. It's hacking it. Right? It's and like, you know, we still we still do not know enough about it. We you know, it's it's like we need some major universities to spend X amount of years and X amount of millions looking in, into this in a, in a lot more detail because uh you know, I think the proof is out there now that you know there is something, there is an effect that's happening. Mm. With millions of trials out there, you know, I've got books here stacked up here that thick with millions of trials in it of remote viewing, for example. Mm. So we know there's an effect there. It's just that there aren't any major universities or or study groups or black projects out there looking. Well, there might be a black project out there, one or two hidden away that's looking at, it, especially if they want to fly some of the craft that they've recovered. Yeah. Um, but in the majority, no one's looking at the role of consciousness in the universe. It's only the fringe sciences that are starting to bring this in into what I think will call it common uh, common awareness. So Ten years ago, you didn't get any UFO researchers even thinking consciousness played any part in in UAPs. Now, over the last year, I see I see I see most of them talking about it, which is great development. Yeah, as I used to it used to kind of annoy me that a wee bit where. You would um you would get one camp who would, who would only believe nuts and bolts and wouldn't yeah. believe experiencers, for example. Yes. Or they wouldn't even look at the consciousness aspect at all. They would just like they would just. But then you get other ones who would look at everything. Or other ones, you, I know you you know you get a lot of different camps like people with negative yeah. and positive yeah. and and all that kind of stuff. But um, I'm just kind of mixed in a whole different camp. <laughs> we were looking yeah. at everything. But, Me um, too. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so, once you see, you know, once you become a remote viewer and you see the things that we see, um. Mm. It changes your whole perspective on the universe in so many ways, because you know you also know that you see things in day to day life where like people shouting at people and being violent and horrible people, and, and because we're viewers, we know that everything in the universe is connected. It's almost like when that person is there wanting to hurt another person because of their color, creed, race, or religion. It's just like you're just hurting another part of yourself because we're all interconnected. So why are you doing this kind of thing? Mm-hmm. It makes you know it opens you up to all kinds of things. It makes you realize that there's so much that's being wasted, and there's so much talent in the human race, you know. And there is something that we can do. Our consciousness could take us in in so many different areas. It's just that we're so invested in the noise of day to day life and making money and buying things and hurting each other that we're just yeah we're just ignoring it. And it's mm-hmm. that's but, it. I mean that, that's the thing as well with this. People would they'd rather rather sit and tune into TikTok and buying buying shit rather <laughs> rather than just like yeah. actually. If, and you know, I've said this to er- many people over the years because you know I do a lot of the the podcasts and radio interviews. Is a uh, mm. meditation, and I know it seems a bit like out there and esoteric and you know a bit weird, but just really basic meditation. You know, for ten minutes a day where you just sit in a quiet space, listen to new, some music, and just concentrate on your breathing if if everyone on the planet just learned how to do that mm. it would make the place so much more of a special and different place just take 10 minutes aside and do meditation it will it literally a 10 minute meditation each day for a period of months can mm. can change your life yeah definitely i agree with you um know that i, I actively participate all the time you know what i mean but i try it but <laughs> yeah. yeah um what makes a what makes a good remote viewer um as a can it be anybody learn it, or does is there certain type of people who are tuned in a bit better, or what, what have you found in your, uh, all the years that you've you've done it? That's a good question. Um, and the common theory is that everyone can do remote viewing, like everyone has an intuition. Um, but we have to be honest in in that, like most things in life, that are skill based. Because learning the remote view is like learning a skill, like you know, being an athlete or or being a martial artist, or, you know, playing the piano, for example. Hmm. Um, each of us, when we try one of those skills, like running or, or playing a piano or a musical instrument, 
you do have a certain amount of natural ability. You know, some some part of it you can get away on natural ability. Yeah. And then there's a part element you put on top, which is practice and dedication over a period of years. Hmm. And so that comes on a scale. You know, I can tap out. I can actually play the East Ender theme on a piano, but I will never play Mozart because that's my natural ability is is at a low level. Um, you know, no matter how much I practice on top of it, I don't think I'll ever get there to do Mozart. Mm-hmm. Whereas with remote viewing, I, I have a bigger natural ability and, you know, add that to the practice, then that's just expanded to me. Mm-hmm. So, yes, everyone can do remote viewing and everyone's a total intuitive. It's just that we will all have different levels of natural ability and mm-hmm. how much we're willing to put into it over a period of years. So it will be a scale of, of ability there, you know, from very, very bad to someone being what we call a rock star remote here, you know, we in one of the best in the world kind of thing. Hmm. Do, yeah. do you ever find that, um, although you're remote viewing, let's say you're remote viewing normally and day-to-day kind of life in your, your job and you're doing remote views, um, do you ever get times where, for example, let's say prime time, wake up in the morning before you go to bed at night, things like that, where you get maybe precognition and things like that. Does that happen through... I know it happens to people, precognition and stuff like that, but do you ever get things like that happen because of the work that you're doing and then maybe you maybe get it, it filters into other parts of your life? Again, another good question. Uh, I would say before before I learned remote viewing, because the entire, um, what we call the classical psychic techniques yeah. are essentially spontaneous, uh, you know, you get your psychic impressions without you having a control over them. I would say I had them on a huge amount then, very spontaneously out of control, just you know, doing my day to day things. I'll get these weird kind of oh, hair standing on the back of my neck. Mm. I need to call someone. I need to do this. Someone's in trouble, that kind of thing. Mm. Now that I've put myself in control of the process so that, you know, it only happens when I sit down and say, right now I'm doing my work. Mm. Um, I think by do put by controlling myself over a period of 26 years, mm. it's atrophy the um spontaneous side of it so i don't i don't get that as nowhere near as much as i used to in the old days so they like over spill out because it's no getting used kind of yeah i mean i think i get the occasional thing in my dreams mm-hmm. um but i don't i don't really get it into my day-to-day life other than you know i'm a designer and a creative mm-hmm. and i i'm i seem to be very good at uh Des- delivering logos and designs to clients. And I think that's because because of my ability with remote viewing, I can put myself into their headspace a lot easier to know what they want as a client to give them the right logo or design. Yeah. 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 Which is more of a gut feeling kind of it's not exactly remote viewing, but yeah, I I'm I uh, it's no, what was it right word? Not empathic. Yeah. And em- you know, I I can get there with the person a lot easier by tuning in yeah. i don't purposely do it i just that's just part of my creative process and i do believe as well to answer your question that uh from what i've seen over 26 years i think the more creative and right brain a person is mm-hmm. the majority that's the majority of the better remote viewers yeah. um although i would add that my ideal team of remote viewers would have you know, maybe a doctor or a nurse, an engineer, an architect, a creative and a scientist on it. So that when you're looking at any kind of target, you have all those life skills from all those people, which could encompass pretty much every target. Mm-hmm. It's the same way. It's the same way most experiences are the same as that as well. Yeah. They all can feel like maybe um, that type of like right brain as well. You know what I mean? If it is right, yeah. It is right I mean, don't get me wrong, you know, some of the remote viewers that I work with are very analytical, very straight laced, kind of like left brain thinking. And they also make good remote viewers because, mm-hmm. um, you know, they're very good at reporting what they see internally. It's just that I found that all oh, a lot of the remote viewers I work with all seem to be very creative people. You know, they, they paint like myself, they do photography, they're designers, they write, you know, they, they seem to have those kind of elements yeah. about them yeah. in, in the majority as, as well. Yeah, I think that it kind of happens as well. We, we it's, With experiences, you get quite a lot of artists, quite a lot of musicians, quite a lot, they've all kind of quite a lot of them had experiences and, yeah. and they, they, a lot of stuff comes for the, I don't know, for the other place, for the, the music and the artwork and the designs, all that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? So, yeah, and, and I've said to people in the past that uh, I truly believe 
the 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 feelings I get with the intuition and the remote viewing seem to bubble up from the same well of information as any all my other creative ideas and expressions come from as well. It seems to be the same thing, but just interpreted differently from through my own internal filters. Mm -hmm. So if um, I'll just ask you a, a couple of questions before we kind of finish up. Um, so if somebody's um, looking to get into it and they're wondering where to start, where would you recommend them go to to start off with? Obviously your own website. Is that yeah, I have huge amounts of resources on my website, including all the free remote viewing manuals. And I even created a one-page template how to do remote viewing uh in a specific method thing uh, mm. and an accompanying video showing how to do that as well. Yeah. So that's a, that's a good place. Um, again, my magazine's great because they, you know, got 19 issues of that for free and you can have a look through the history articles, mm. all that kind of stuff. And I also have a, a huge uh, YouTube channel called remote viewed. Mm -hmm. And on there, there's all throughout the pandemic because, because none of us could meet. Yeah. I started doing these Friday night chats where I would interview the top people within remote viewing for two hours at a time. Yeah. And all those talks are on there for people to have a look at for free as well. And they're, they're packed with information. And a lot of the people on there that I've interviewed are, are people like, you know, some of the CIA military spies that, that were part of the Stargate unit. Yeah. yeah. Is, so, that the, the, is that the signal line? Um, the, the signal line is the audio audio version. Yeah, of that it's well. audio so podcast. They, yeah. I but drive, videos, so that's what I listen to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> But the videos themselves are all, yeah. They're, if you go to YouTube and then uh, Remote Viewed, um, it will come up there. And there's there's probably about a hundred or or so videos there, which are really informative for people. And you know, sometimes like every every three or four weeks, I get together with the community, and there's probably 30, 40 of us, just as normal remote viewers. Yeah, we meet up, we discuss and talk about theories, talk about examples you know, question yourselves, are we doing something wrong? Could we do this kind of stuff to make it better? And all those talks are up there online as well. So they get to see normal people just trying, like myself, just trying to work out what's going on with this. Because, you know, as I said to you, we still have no idea how this works. We're, we're mm -hmm. trying to experiment with it day in, day out, month in, month out, to try to improve it and to mm -hmm. take it in new directions. Brilliant, brilliant. Right, well, what we've got to do, I'll, I'll get all your, um, I'll put the links in the show notes for any listeners that want to um, follow up. I'll definitely be doing it myself as well. So I'm, I'm kind of working my way through the signal line um, as I'm, I'm driving and stuff. So that's it's yeah. quite good for me. I mean, but really, really good discussions. Um, Thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm going for the start, but I've actually kind of jumped to one of the ones that was at the end of the one with uh, Joe okay, McConaughey. Yeah. Was, that was quite a good one. So I'm kind of yeah, going yeah. through that. So, like, Daz, that's been brilliant. And um, been great like, chat thanks, for, thank you for coming on. And uh, we'll yeah, like, we'll, we'll speak to you well, again at some point. Yeah, we'll have to do it again. It'd be fantastic. Yeah. Definitely brilliant. Mm -hmm.